Now you will be always in the window or you will disappear. Sir, I'll be there alongside with you. Yeah. So that way in case there is any interruption or discontinuity of any kind, we can communicate. Yes, sir. So we'll be starting now. Okay. Good morning. We welcome you all on the Wells Fargo Day 4th of Shastra 2022 for the Spotlight Lecture Series presented by MTX. As we continue with our journey to inspire, energize, and motivate the student community with a bigger and better lineup this year, we are honored to have with us today Mr. Vinod Dham, more popularly known as the father of the Pendium Chip. Mr. Dham successfully led the efforts of I-386, I-486, and the Pentium processor families, helping Intel become the largest company in the semiconductor industry. He is also the founding managing director of Indo-US Venture Partners, an early stage venture capital focused on India. Of late, he has been actively involved in helping the startup and entrepreneurs to ensure the startup ecosystem thrives. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. So we shall now move on to the fireside chat. Starting off, as the father of Pentium chip, you're well known for your work on the Pentium processor. Could you share with us your journey and the challenges you encountered during its development? All right. I think uh, that's going to be a little bit of a long-winded answer. Uh, and since it was almost 30 years ago, I took some time to sit down and capture my thoughts to make sure I didn't miss any of the key points uh, of that era that drove us to success. So I'll give you a little bit of a context of what went on. Pentium, as you know, was a fifth generation processor, launched about a decade after the first IBM PC. Pentium was very pivotal in the last 30 years for Intel's dominance in the microprocessor and PC industry. and its survival of Cisco architecture, which is basically the x86 architecture. With the enormous success of 486, the chip industry realized, and the PC industry in general realized, that there was a great opportunity uh, for entering a huge new market for decades to come and make billions of dollars. So in the early 90s, just about when I had started developing Pentium, I would say kind of World War III started. And this World War III was joined by who's who in the giants of US semiconductor industry and even some European and Japanese uh, companies. Except there was one difference in this World War. All of these companies were collectively focused on only one goal. One, defeating Pentium, and second, dislodging Intel from its dominance that it had in the x86 and then therefore PC computing processor. I'll give you a little perspective on what was going on because I felt it myself every day in, in, in surviving the whole Pentium ordeal. Uh, we had next door to us a company called Sun Microsystem, which were a dominant player in workstations. And they clearly had now a desire to build PC type machines and that could operate on the desktop. And they started their own chips, uh, Spark chips called Viking, if I remember correctly. Uh, there was a company, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation in the East Coast, uh, that actually was very, very strong in uh, mini computers and VAX line of computers. They also started building chips for the PC industry. And lo and behold, uh, IBM, who was a big customer of ours, Motorola, who was a big competitor of ours, and Apple, who was using very small amount of uh, chips, and so we are ignoring them at that time, uh, put together a, a consortium. I think it was called the, uh, the uh, Somerset Consortium. And Somerset, by the way, is a uh, Latin word, if I remember right, that says that put every, everybody should put their arms down because they are coming and they're taking over the world. Uh, not only that, other players like HP uh, and Fujitsu and some players, uh, in Europe, they were all aiming for Pentium. And this that's why Pentium became extremely important uh, play for Intel and Intel's existence. Uh, now, beyond these companies, there were some startups that came into play. And we got to see some flavors of who our friends were. There was a startup started by 
a uh, Stanford professor who actually made RISC chips, which was the other alternative to what we were building, the SIS chips, that actually got started at that time. The company's name was MIPS Computer. And people who funded the company in, were our friends like Microsoft, because Microsoft was a software company. It didn't really matter to them who wins the hardware race. All they wanted to make sure was that they will be the operating system of choice, no matter who wins the race. So they actually funded this uh, MIF computer and join hands, believe it or not, with Intel's number one customer, which was Compaq computer that actually doesn't exist because HP bought Compaq uh, 10, 15 years ago. So Compaq doesn't exist as a standalone company. But at that time, uh, one of the biggest players in microprocessor PC computing was Compaq because they took a lead on C86 and built their PCs and, and, and went beyond what uh, uh, IBM was doing. So we had a huge challenge and our challenge was very simple. We need to get to the market faster than everybody else, be the first one, so we have first mover advantage, make sure we keep a healthy performance margin, at least 2x that of the 486 on an average, so that people still find it incrementally useful to use our computers. Um, and then uh, we had this enormous money uh, from the cash call 486, which also I managed and I was a general manager of billions of dollars we were making in cash. We used that money to start many, many fabs and started producing many, many Pentiums to make sure we'll flood the market with Pentium so that even when these people do come, we will be so dominant with our presence that they will have a hard time uh, establishing themselves. Having said that, rest of it, you know, is a history. We won the game and not only won against these people. In fact, most of these companies don't even exist today. And some of them who exist are not even big, big names anymore. This is how badly we defeated them. Thank you, sir, for the detailed answer. It was actually really insightful. So coming to the next phase, after leaving Intel in 1995, you ended up working for AMD where, when NextGen was acquired by AMD and helped develop the K6 processor, which was also known as the Pentium Killer Processor. What was it like to compete against something that you had a major role to play with? So to put it again in the context, um, by the time um, AMD was building K6 and launching K6, the competition from Intel, Intel had already shifted beyond Pentium to what they call internally a chip called Pentium 2. Uh, and so K6 was launched to beat Intel's Pentium 2, not Pentium. So it was even a higher goal for K6. And I'm very proud to tell you that actually for about six months or nine months, when we launched K6, K6 was the highest performance x86 chip in the world. That is, it had beaten Intel on the x86 platform. And that I was told by my colleagues and friends and other people who worked for me at Intel was a big, big uh, negative for them inside of Intel because the management was very unhappy that that big uh, you know, crown that they had of always being the highest performance in the leading x86 processor was stolen away for by AMD for a period of six, eight months. And I was at the helm of affairs when that happened. Now, going back into, and I think what it did, by the way, the fact that K6 came out before Intel's Pentium 2 with the same performance, it allowed AMD a competitive advantage, which they used to position themselves as a low cost PC entry. Until that point, all the personal computers were always sold for roughly $2,000. And Intel's game plan was every year, come up with better and better chips, but keep the, perform uh, the price of the computer same, except offer higher value add to the customer. And that was selling very well. Uh, but there were now a lot of customers who could not afford to buy a $2,000 computer. They needed a cheaper computer, but Intel would not deliver a cheaper computer because it would reduce the price of their chips. But AMD took that plunge and actually introduced a sub $1,000 PC that really became extremely popular 
and forced Intel to enter that market with initially a uh, version of Pentium that they made uh, somewhat defunct uh, in order to make it a uh, little bit lower performance. But I think there was a chip called Celeron that they introduced later on to compete with Intel's uh, AMD's uh, K6. Now, I don't want to uh, leave this with the impression that everything was hunky-dory. When I left Intel to join next year, which was my first four year into a startup, it was a very cautious step of going into a company that actually was going to do something similar to what I had done, and therefore the risk would be less. I quickly realized how nightmarish a software uh, is a startup can be. Every day there is a, a, a new issue that comes up, but the biggest issue for NextGen was they had no fab. That is unlike Intel, which had their own fab and they could optimize their process of performance to maximize the performance of the overall uh, architecture. NextGen had no such freedom. In fact, the access they had to the technology in process was very old generation and therefore they were, even though their designers were very competent, they could not uh, show their two metal because they didn't have the latest and the greatest technology. Uh, beyond that, there were some other issues too that we fixed uh, and that's why AMD uh, bought NextGen. Like the chip that we were building was made Pentium bus compatible until then NextGen had very uh, proprietary bus and therefore it required a completely new type of PC, which a lot of people were not uh, very uh, eager to build. So um, anyway, at NextGen being my first startup, I did learn quite a lot about what a startup environment is and how to really succeed in a startup environment. Sir, so uh, as you talked about startups and all, you, uh, you must have seen that there, there was a very uh, like huge increase in the demand for portable and small devices uh, with the advent of IoT. How is the microprocessor industry coping up with this change and what additional constraints does it set on the processors used? So first and foremost, I would say a dominant part of IoTs, I would say practically all of them, which are portable devices like, uh, you know, iPhones, iPads, or variety of other devices people are making uh, throughout the industry, they're all developed on some variant of the ARM uh, architecture, which is the architecture that really dominates the mobile phone industry, if you will. and the reason for that is IoT being on the edge required very, very low power. And ARM was one of the architectures that was designed right up front with the uh, focus on not on performance, but on power. And therefore they became extremely well entrenched in that particular market. Uh, x86 and uh, other architectures have practically no presence and ARM is dominating that aspect of market. now. In laptops, where the operating system is dominated by Windows, uh, clearly x86, Intel, and AMD uh, int, uh, are both very, very uh, popular. Now, where Apple is present with its iOS, uh, Apple is clearly using now its own ARM-based chips to make its laptop, which really is a huge issue because it takes away the market share from Intel and AMD. But I think a bigger issue that industry is worried about is that Microsoft has started creating an operating system for the ARM chip. And their desire is to use that for the surface computer. But if it's successful in surface computer, I have a feeling that it will also go into laptops and other machines. And therefore, it will further put pressure on companies like Intel and AMD where x86 processors are dominant. So that was really good to know. And also, as we, uh, you talked about ARM technology, which is used in uh, many of the phones uh, already. Uh, we also know that you have led efforts for the creation of telecom processors at Silicon Spice that enabled multi-board voice over internet protocol. Could you tell us a little bit more about your work there? Yes, the uh, actually, Building a VOIP chip at Silicon Spice was kind of a pivot from its original goal, which was based on building a multi-port modem. And that didn't seem to uh, work very well. So we pivoted the company and luckily we had both as a 
uh, investor on the board of the company, Cisco. And when we told Cisco that we were having difficulty deliver what we originally planned for the company, and they felt that we had a great team of technologists and designers and great track record, they came back to us and being a leader in switching and routing industry themselves, they were able to see what was happening in terms of uh, packet switching, uh, also using voice as a packet to make voice to go over internet as a protocol and make voice calls based on mobile phones as opposed to traditional telecom equipment, which was a circuit switch based industry till then. So they came to us and they said, look, this is what we see as the future. And would you build a chip for us? And clearly we were excited to really have something to build and we build that chip. And again, rest of the history, the company was acquired for over a billion dollars by Broadcom, who was uh, the company that basically supplied a lot of the needs that Cisco had as a big company, and they prefer to buy from them as opposed to buying it from us. So we ended up selling ourselves to them. But uh, today you use uh, WhatsApp, is basically an example of the voice over IP technology, which now goes into all this packet uh, technology and people just use it every day without knowing literally what's going on inside. Thank you for those insights, sir. Uh, in recent years, we have seen the adoption of chips with multi cores over single cores, focusing both on performance and efficiency. What is your opinion on the transition from single core system to the improved multi core system? You know, I mean, the, the, so the future trend is going to be all multi core. Uh, as uh, we go into 3D rendering, gaming, video editing, and all these types of uh, new applications which didn't exist when original PCs were built, uh, there is a need for parallel processing, multi-threading, and multi-cores enable significant amount of that. Now, multi-cores don't necessarily uh, linearly increase the performance by number of cores that you add, because we still don't have a lot of uh, software written up to parallelize these cores in an efficient manner. But this trend is very positive and I think continue. I think both uh, Intel, I think is at 12 core or something like that. And uh, so is uh, AMD for their PCs. And then if you go to NVIDIA for gaming, I think they use <laughs> hundreds and thousands of cores for gaming because they are the need for the parallelization and the added advantage in the gaming is significant higher. So that's the right trend. Okay, sir. Um, we have also seen that Moore's law is failing and the breakdown of Denard scaling. What do you think are the key hurdles in the field of computer architecture as it stands now? And what research is being done to address them? Very good point. You know, uh, Moore's law is about 50 years old. And as you know, it was about doubling of uh, number of transistors every 18 months which eventually when we started building microprocessor, we translated into doubling of performance every two years, which was really not the original law, but we kind of uh, twisted it uh, to make people understand what we were trying to do. And Denner clearly was a guy who actually uh, went in deep into the physics of the transistor the device itself and talked about how the voltage will have to scale for the power density to also scale so the Moore's law can uh, truly come to fruition, except Dennard's scaling broke down sometime, I think, far sooner than Moore's law. Moore's law is still kind of in a, a different uh, tangent uh, slope than it was. It's still going on. We are seven nanometer, five nanometer, three nanometer. People can see down to one nanometer and things like that. But Dennard law broke down, I think, in Pentium, three generation, as you know, after Pentium 3, 4, there was no Pentiums. And the reason for that is the power density was so high. It was like you have a several hundred watt bulb that you're holding uh, inside of a machine. That was not a workable option. So that's why there was a uh, major, major push toward multi-core, by the way, because in multi-core, you get uh, optimized the, the, the performance. You don't get very high performance, but you get higher performance. But at a lower power. So that trend uh, has helped some. Now, looking forward, I think something very interesting is happening. 
the i think there's some kind of a renaissance of computer architecture in my opinion that's coming again over the next year 10 years you will hear some exciting things about computer architectures after a lull of about 10 15 20 years of period the reason for that is the whole uh, uh, explosion of ai and machine learning and in ai and machine learning the key thing is you have to have architectures fine tuned to specific workloads that is you look at for example cloud computing which has to deal with millions of bits of data uh, per second and they then analyze the data to see what kind of data then they are able to see certain data that repeat themselves very often if they can accelerate just that part of data by adding an instruction or creating an algorithm in software they can get significantly higher performance than they would with a general purpose computer that trend is just started in my opinion and it will continue to evolve for a long time because ai machine learning also is being very uh, used in a very limited way currently it needs to go into every field of computing and software whether it's healthcare or it's fintech or it's uh, agriculture just name it it's, we have to make uh, ai machine learning almost like a part of the stack uh, as we used to for computer security. So I, I see a very interesting future for um, computer architectures, except I must say, since it will be very diverse, distributed, and piecemeal, it will be somewhat opportunistic, uh, uneven, and sporadic. So we'll not, it won't be like x86 doing Pentium, Pentium 1, Pentium 2, Pentium, you won't hear things like that, but you'll hear different, different people creating different, different architectures and all of them in, for their own application, very unique and very uh, interesting and innovative. So we really hope we can achieve that soon. You, you were talking about AI and machine learning in computer architecture. So continu continuing on the same theme, Machine learning is a very active area of interest for many computer science and AI enthusiasts. So machine learning also, ta uh, the machine learning tasks are quite computationally intensive owing to the large amounts of data involved. Do you think we require a breakthrough in the realm of computer architecture to meet the demand demands of AI and ML community? Or we already had one, as you were talking about? Well, we, we don't have one. We need a breakthrough. And, and we, are, we are beginning to start the process but we do need a breakthrough because, see, what's happened is the uh, AI and machine learning, which is really quite old, if you go back and probably go back to 60s when the first ideas of AI were uh, started, and then there were some attempts made, but then they kind of uh, failed. During the 80s, there was a significant setback uh, in those attempts, and therefore people lost interest. But the AI had some kind of a renaissance. Again, I would say, uh, about 10 years ago in 2006, seven period uh, with the advent of deep learning, with of course Moore's law coming to a point where the gaming chips that NVIDIA was making suddenly could also do significant amount of uh, deep learning. And that deep learning uh, really created this, this great opportunity for not NVIDIA, but for the entire industry to start using AI again. But as you know, deep learning is extremely compute intensive. And uh, we don't have enough uh, compute to do really the most serious deep learning jobs like drug development or weather forecasting or things of that nature cannot be done still because deep learning is um, a, a very uh, tedious, manual and difficult task, if you will. Now, to your second part, clearly, I think I already see there's some news items that talk about where machine learning is being used to actually automate the process of designing the new computers themselves. So it's a very interesting paradigm. The new computers are being designed with new algorithms of machine learning and new machine, algorithms of machine learning will design new computers and they will help each, each other in a way to perhaps improve the overall productivity, reduce the manual labor, and uh, create higher performance architectures. But clearly that is required. Absolutely, I agree that there's a need for that. 
Thank you for the answer, sir. I really hope we can see AI being uh, de deployed in to build the state of art of architecture, especially in computer, in the upcoming future. As we talk about the future, we let's move on to quantum computers. Quantum computers have been a prominent advancement in recent times, given the fact that quantum computers store information in the form of qubits rather than digital bits. How are the microprocessor chips in quantum computers different from those in regular ones? If you could shine some light on this topic. So I'll preface by uh, saying that I'm really not an expert in quantum computing. Uh, and I have not really dwelled much into quantum computing. And I'll tell you that's partly because in my humble opinion, that until the issue of maintaining coherence in a sustainable way, is solved, I think building a scalable quantum computer is going to be a huge challenge. Now, you will hear about 53-bit quantum computing computer from Google, then somebody in China makes it 66 bits, and then IBM comes and says they'll make 73 bits, and practically all of them are below 100 bit. But in reality, they have to migrate to hundreds of thousands or millions of qubits before they can truly become viable for solving the kind of complex problems and issues that the quantum computers are being designed for. And for them to get to that point, they have to have some stability in, uh, and coherence in their environment. Uh, the qubits are incredibly fragile. Uh, even the slightest variance in uh, vibrations, radiation, electromagnetic waves, or temperature can knock them off. And therefore, all of your you know, computation can become an error and therefore you don't really get any results. So until, in my opinion, this particular issue is put to rest, uh, at least I will not be getting too excited and spending a lot of time trying to figure out where it's going. Okay, sir. And uh, uh, with respect to the instruction set of architectures, could you tell us about a bit about what the current scenario in commercially available processes look like? How have these been developed upon the initial idea of RISE, the risk architecture? So in, in, in my uh, understanding and opinion of the landscape of all of the architectures that I have looked at, and there are really three dominant ones. There's a x86 and there's a... Uh, ARM chip, two dominant ones, right? Uh, they're all basically risk. The CISC machines are also risk, by the way. If you look at Intel chips today, which are CISC, they're also risk. The only difference is they have an added overhead of backward compatibility for the legacy application software, uh, which gives them that edge that they keep on, people keep on buying them which RISC don't have because RISC machines have to be either done by someone like Apple, which controls both. Apple is like Vintel. It is a combination of Intel and Microsoft. That is, it builds its own operating system, iOS, and it builds its own chip, which is the ARM M1 or whatever they call them. So they are in a position and not only they do that, they also build a lot of their own application software. So if you build all three things, then you can uniquely optimize your architecture to get significantly more advantage in overall performance of the system that neither Intel or Microsoft or an application vendor alone can get. So that is why uh, Apple is winning the game right now. So that's very interesting to know. Um, coming to your, uh, um, let's let's talk about your startup scene. We have seen you working with many startups in both the Indian and the Western sphere. The startup scenario has also changed a lot since when you have started as it is now. What are the differences you see and think are important to notice? So the, the my involvement with this uh, startup really uh, seen in India started with my becoming a venture capitalist. So that you know, I'm not either an MBA or uh, a finance graduate. So, uh, but that particular interest really evoked for two reasons. One is I had a strong passion to do something for India because that's a country I've come from. 
and I am today who I am, and the foundation of that was laid in India by the undergraduate education I got from Delhi College of Engineering. So that was a big calling for me that I had to go address. And the second way, the way I wanted to address that was since I'm not a software engineer, there were people like Narayan Murthy and, and um, Ashim Premji who were back in 2000 doing a wonderful job of doing uh, software as a service. So the, and, and India was not ready for chip at that time. It's probably still is in, uh, in a big way. So I looked, I'd searched uh, heavily into my own heart and said, what could I do? And I said, yeah, what if we started some venture capital in India and created a couple of success stories and then it will take off like fire and a lot of people will start doing it. And that really was a pioneering spirit I had with half a dozen other people uh, who were my colleagues from Silicon Valley who had similar dreams, who all went to India back in 2005, six to start this startup. Uh, investment team. And mind it, we really at that time, most of us didn't know what to encounter. And what we encountered was the situation was relatively quite green in terms of the entrepreneurs really didn't have a full understanding of what venture capital and how, what the uh, funding and series A, B, C and all these equity structures and cap tables and all these things they didn't know, which is great. That's why we went there to really introduce them to these ideas. And the second thing was there's no ecosystem. Right? There were only a few handful of players who really had to depend on each other to make these companies successful. And now, when I look at India, it's like really vibrant with the startup team and who is who of the VC industries there. Money is no issue. If you have an idea, you really can uh, get the funding and pursue it. So from the time that we went, uh, the biggest change I see in India, which I'm very, very heartened and very happy to see, during my time, most of the engineers who were coming out as entrepreneurs had a very uh, service attitude. When I say service attitude, they were coming from IT industry. In IT industry, is an industry in India where they are being told what to do. <laughs> and uh, either Goldman Sachs tell them we want this software or Bank of America tell them to go do this backend work or whatever. So these engineers were fantastic, but they were used to only being told what to do, and then they will do a great job, outstanding job. We needed somebody who can create the thinking themselves, not being told what to do, but who comes back and says, this is what I want to do. And now I'm noticing in India, there is a more product-related focus, a lot of SaaS type of startups or cloud computing, where people are coming up with their own ideas, getting funded. In fact, I've heard there are scores of uh, unicorns already uh, which is fantastic news for uh, India and its entrepreneurs and its economy. So it's very heartening to see that the seed we laid back in 2005, 6, 15, 20 years later is beginning to really shape up and, and show some growth. Now in US, basically, I believe in a secular theme. And the secular theme is the whole world needs to be digitized. See, there was a 50 years of this uh, Moore's law of exponential growth of performance of chip and reduction in uh, cost to a degree where chip has become a commodity. In fact, chips are so, some of the or regular chips are cheaper than potato chips you can buy in a, in a store today. So really, the, the 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 magic has to be the software. So software has to eat the world, and software is eating the world. It's penetrating into every aspect of every market segment and every industry that we know of. And today in America, all of the uh, companies that are going IPO or getting acquired or becoming unicorns, and there are 978 of them, almost close to 1,000, are practically software companies. So that was really insightful to know about and uh, particularly very fascinating to understand the startup ecosystem, both in US and India, from your view. Finally, like you have had an illustrious career during your 16 years working with Intel and now as a venture capitalist for the past decade. What are some of the life lessons you have learned as you march through different phases of your life? If, you'd li if you would like to share some with us. So before I uh, share various phases of my life, which is basically parallels my career, uh, I would say when I reflect back into my own life and my career, 
and say, what is it that made me who I am and got me to be where I am? And I would say it distills down to basically two things. One, discover your strength and build upon it. For each one of us, we have some unique strength that is in us. And it's not necessarily just the skills that we acquire through academic education or going to colleges or getting some training, but it's also some inherent skill like leadership skill or management skill or things of that nature. So I discovered early on, and actually Intel discovered it for me, and therefore it became obvious to me that not only I had good grasp of technology and was able to work on few inventions and create patents and publish papers and make presentations in technical conferences, but it also had an ability to inspire other colleagues of mine and lead them uh, in a larger group of people to create much more complex and uh, difficult programs. So that is why I kept on getting these assignments within Intel to keep on doing more and more complex and difficult and important projects for the company. So you have to discover what is it that about you and then really build upon it. Make sure that you make yourself stronger and stronger in that direction. And second thing I would say is, remember that fortune favors the bold. Those who take risk often reap the great rewards. And this I learned primarily when I stepped out of Intel and did next gen and then did Silicon Spice and then played in venture capital that you have to really take some risk to get the reward. If you don't really want to take the risk, that's fine, no harm. Maybe you're not suited mentally for that and maybe you're suited just to do you know, fantastic research. We need people like that in this world too, don't take me wrong. But if you have an inclination to really be like uh, a successful in building some great name and great products in the industry, then you have to take some risk and put yourself on the limb and prove yourself to be wrong sometime if, if that's needed. Now in my, about the phases of my life, I think I consider myself to be very lucky that very early on, just after graduation from my undergraduate college, I happened to have accidentally stumbled into a solitary semiconductor company in India that existed, a private company. Most people and a lot of my friends and colleagues didn't even know, including me, by the way, I just happened to have stumbled into somebody who uh, introduced me to the company. Its name was Continental Devices India Limited. They were building discrete semiconductor chips. Uh, and the company was started with the help of Teledyne Semiconductors from Hawthorne, California, with all their technology, process technology, diffusion, epitaxy, metallization, lithography. All the equipment was sold by them to uh, uh, Continental. And we, some of us, handful of young people who uh, were basically building that startup, which I didn't realize what a startup was at that time. We didn't use that word, but now I look back, that was literally a startup because we did the first runs, we produced the first chips, and we sold the first chips uh, abroad uh, for export market. But that's where my passion for semiconductor started. And that led me to come to US, that led me to go to Intel, that led me to start two semiconductor companies led me to go into venture capital because of successes I had. So that is really what has been my story. Now at the end of the game, I am basically a retired man uh, who still dabbles with the uh, angel investing into some interesting ideas, especially in the AI chip and stuff like that. But beyond that, I built some uh, beautiful homes for my family primarily. And I'm into architecting and designing new homes and building them as a showcase pieces for people to come and see and live in and enjoy. So that's my other, building a home, by the way, turns out to be somewhat akin to building a chip. So I'm enjoying that process. So that was really good to know. And I'm sure the audience takes notes of all the life lessons you have shared with us. Before ending the session today, is there final mess any final message you would give to our audience present and especially the student community of IIT Madras? Yeah, I think, and this message is not only for the student community of IIT Madras, but uh, kids of this generation, especially one who are entering uh, the college now, I mean, they have absolutely no idea how good they've got it made for themselves. A, I think they should in their heart be very, very happy that they are born in an era that they have arrived after 50 years of innovations that have 
created a platform that they can, each one of them can create their idea and plug and play into the platform and create companies with small amount of money. We call them lean startups because that wasn't possible any time before in the history of mankind. So they are very unique. They are very special. And they are really arriving at a wonderful time to uh, make themselves um, successful. And I would actually encourage all of them, unlike me and my generation, who grew up to always think of where will I find a job? Which company should I go to? Is it IBM better? Or should I go to Intel? Or should I go to Texas Instrument? They should not be doing any of that. They should be thinking of starting their own little company. And it doesn't have to become IBM. It can still remain a small company. And it may still be just small enough that they make enough money for them and their family or with their friends together to enjoy both the journey of building a company, being their own boss, creating something special. And I think there's nothing like an entrepreneurial journey in life. Thank you, sir. It was really inspiring and insightful to chat with you today. We believe that the audience would have enjoyed every single minute of it. Once again, we sincerely thank you for joining us today for the Fireside Chat. For the audience, please fill the feedback form shared in the YouTube chat, which will help us improve in the upcoming sessions. We thank you once again. Upcoming, we have Dr. Mr. Andrew Weinrich at 5.30 p.m., so stay tuned to Shastra IDM's YouTube channel. Thank you, Dhruv, for hosting.